Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting here in Madison, Wisconsin. We are so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. And tonight we're returning to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're back to our study of the book of Numbers. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible of your own and turning with us to Numbers chapter 31. We'll be in Numbers chapters 31, 32, and 33 tonight. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we plan on looking at Numbers 31 through 33, which should be our next to the last study in the book of Numbers. And next week, then, we hope to wrap it up with the last three chapters. As you know, if you've been with us up to this point, we are moving rather quickly, uh, covering several chapters at a time. So three chapters tonight. By way of very brief review, just in case you're joining us for the first time, the Numbers is a book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is a book of Numbers. And the book of Numbers, we have Moses conducting a census of the people two times, once at the beginning of the 40 years in the wilderness, and then again toward the end of that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So we're now at the very end. They've done the second census already. We covered that a couple weeks ago, and they are now camped out practically right across the river from the city of Jericho. And they are preparing to make the leadership transition from Moses to Joshua. So uh, Moses has kind of picked Joshua. Maybe he's learning on the job over the next several weeks. So that's kind of where we are. So let's jump right into it tonight with some follow-up from the deception of the Israelites that came as a consequence of Balaam's advice to King Balak. Uh, King Balak of the Midianites. So this is Numbers 31, and let's just look at the first 12 verses as we begin. Numbers 31, 1 through 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take full vengeance for the sons of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward you will be gathered to your people. Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war, that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. A thousand from each tribe of all the tribes of Israel you shall send to the war. So there were furnished from the thousands of Israel a thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. Moses sent them a thousand from each tribe to the war, and Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest to the war with them, and the holy vessels and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. So they made war against Midian, just as the Lord had commanded Moses, and they killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian along with the rest of their slain, Evi and Rechem and Zer and Hur and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. The sons of Israel captured the women of Midian and their little ones, and all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods they plundered. Then they burned all their cities where they lived and all their camps with fire. They took all the spoil and all the prey, both of man and of beast. They brought the captives and the prey and the spoil to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation of the sons of Israel, to the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by the Jordan opposite Jericho. Well, what happens in this chapter then is vengeance. However, I want us to notice that this is not Moses' vengeance. This is not the people taking vengeance personally, but what we have here is a command from God, take full vengeance for the sons of Israel on the Midianites. So this vengeance then comes at God's command. And when this is done, Moses will pretty much be done as well. That's what God explains here. So Moses starts gathering. He starts arranging the people for battle. Certainly, I would imagine Joshua had something to do with this. And notice he spreads the burden equally by calling for a thousand troops from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So a fighting force of 12,000 men. And an interesting detail here is that Moses assigns Phineas as the commander of this battle. If you remember, Phineas, I believe, is the grandson of Aaron. And he was the guy a few chapters ago who got so mad when he saw the Israelite bring his Midianite girlfriend into the tent of meeting. And he saw that. He was so hot with anger that he spears both of them through simultaneously. And that's what brought an end to that plague. And he was promoted at that time. God was impressed by that zeal. And Moses now calls on this man, Phinehas, to lead the men in battle against the Midianites. So a very appropriate choice 
Uh, we know that this guy can get things done. We know he has some righteous anger. We know he has a history with the Midianites. And so this man is put in charge. And what they are commanded to do, they do, don't they? Absolutely. They go to war and they kill the kings of Midian. And then they also make a note here that they kill Balaam the prophet. Remember, Balaam was the one who apparently suggested that since God wouldn't let him curse the Israelites, the, the Midianites could just seduce the Israelites to commit adultery and worship their gods, their idols. Then God would punish them and the Midianites then might have a chance. And so this was the workaround. And since there was no curse to be had, he kind of made God curse them for him by having them sin. And so God is now taking vengeance on that deception. Well, they kill the men. They capture the women. They capture the children along with the flocks and the cattle and the stuff. And they burn the cities. And then they bring this huge pile of loot and all of these captives back to Moses at the camp. So let's continue then tonight with Numbers 31, verses 13 through 24. So the next passage, the next paragraph here, Numbers 31, verses 13 through 24. Let's see what happens next. Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the leaders of the congregation went out to meet them outside the camp. Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds who had come from service in the war. And Moses said to them, Have you spared all the women? Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man intimately. But all the girls who have not known man intimately spare for yourselves and you camp outside the camp seven days. Whoever has killed any person and whoever has touched any slain, purify yourselves, you and your captives. On the third day and on the seventh day, you shall purify for yourselves every garment and every article of leather and all the works of goat hair, work of goat hair, and all the articles of wood. Then Eleazar the priest said to the men of war who had gone to battle, This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded Moses. Only the gold and the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can stand the fire, you shall pass through the fire, and it shall be clean, but it shall be purified with water for impurity. But whatever cannot stand the fire, you shall pass through the water, and you shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean, and afterward you may enter the camp. Yeah. Well, notice starting in verse 13, when they bring the captives back to Moses, Moses is upset. And he's mad because they saved the very people who were guilty of seducing the nation and causing the plague. And that would be primarily the women. And so he has them kill all the women who had known men intimately. Those were the ones who were guilty of seducing the Israelites. And then they were to kill the boys, perhaps because they were more of a threat to the inheritance rights going forward. We're not told the reason here. And they were to spare the little girls, keeping them for themselves. So maybe as slaves or as wives, we're not told. That's all the information that we have. But following the, the sorting of these people, following the slaughter, uh, the men were to purify themselves. They were ceremonially, uh, uh, ceremonially unclean as a result of interacting with these foreigners, as well as as the result of touching the dead. So this purification process continues for seven days. Uh, in the second paragraph, Eleazar the priest explains they are to purify what they've saved using uh, fire. And so they are to save the precious metals, the lead, uh, anything usable like that, anything else is to be burned or washed. And then the men are allowed to re-enter the camp. So let's continue with Numbers 31, verses 25 through 47. Let's see what happens next. Numbers 31, 25 through 47. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You and Eleazar the priest and the heads of the father's households of the congregation take account of the booty that was captured, both of man and of animal, and divide the booty between the warriors who went out to battle and all the congregation. Levy a tax for the Lord from the men of war who went out to battle, one in five hundred of the persons and of the cattle and of the donkeys and of the sheep, take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest as an offering to the Lord. From the sons of Israel's half, you shall take one drawn out of every fifty of the persons of the cattle, of the donkeys and of the sheep from all the animals and give them to the Levites who keep charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. Moses and Eleazar the priest did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now the booty that remained from the spoil which the men of war had plundered was 675,000 sheep, 30, 
uh, 33 is the verse, and 72,000 cattle and 61,000 donkeys, and of human beings, of the women who had not known man intimately, all the persons were 32,000. The half, the portion of those who went out to war, was as follows. The number of sheep was 337,500, and the Lord's levy of the sheep was 675, and the cattle were 36,000, from which the Lord's levy was seven, uh, 72. And the donkeys were 30,500, from which the Lord's levy was 61. And the human beings were 16,000, from whom the Lord's levy was 32 persons. Moses gave the levy, which was the Lord's offering, to Eleazar the priest, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. As for the sons of Israel's half, which Moses separated from the men who had gone to war, uh, now the congregation's half was 337,500 sheep and 36,000 cattle and 30,500 donkeys and the human beings were 16,000 and from the sons of Israel's half Moses took one drawn out of every 50 both of uh, man and of animals and gave them to the Levites who kept charge of the tabernacle of the Lord just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Well, um, we are not going through this line by line, word by word, but I, the big idea here is Moses and Elias are the priests are to work together with the heads of the households uh, to figure out what they brought back from the battle and then to divide that appropriately between the warriors and those who stayed at home. Uh, in other words, even though the warriors did the work, so to speak, they still had to share with those back home. And it seems like the Lord's tax on the warriors was less, if I've understood that correctly. One out of every 500 instead of one out of every 50. But this is what they do, and it is a huge ordeal. I mean, we can hardly imagine capturing 675,000 sheep, 72,000 cattle, and so on. And then how do you handle all of that? And so half goes to the warriors, half goes to the rest. Uh, with a certain percentage going to the Levites out of each group. So let's continue with Numbers 31, 48 through 54. The next paragraph, Numbers 31, 48 through 54. Then the officers who were over the thousands of the army, the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds, approached Moses, and they said to Moses, Your servants have taken a census of men of war who are in our charge, and no man of us is missing. So we have brought as an offering to the Lord what each man found, articles of gold, armlets and bracelets, signet rings, earrings and necklaces, to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. Moses and Eleazar the priest took the gold from them, all kinds of wrought articles, all the gold of the offering which they offered up to the Lord from the captains of thousands, and the captains of hundreds was 16,750 shekels, the men of war had taken booty, every man for himself. So Moses and Eleazar the priest took the gold from the captains of thousands and of hundreds and brought it to the tent of meeting as a memorial for the sons of Israel before the Lord. Well, here at the end, after the battle with the Midianites, the leaders of each of those thousand troops from each tribe, uh, they take a census, which I mean, obviously you'd want to do what happened here, and they realize that nobody is missing. And that right there is huge, isn't it? They have just gone to war with another nation. They've gone to war with multiple kings. And the Israelites do not lose a single man in battle. And that right there, just absolutely uh, terrific. And so in response, these men bring an offering to the Lord from the spoils of war. And as I understand it, this would have been above and beyond what they brought previously. So all kinds of gold, uh, various pieces of jewelry that they took for themselves and again that seems to be in addition to the offering of one out of 50 and one out of 500 from the previous paragraph this is a free will offering so this is from their own stash we might say so this is taken then to the tent of meeting as an offering well let's continue into the next chapter numbers 32 verses 1 through 5 numbers 32 1 through 5 now the sons of reuben and the sons of gad had an exceedingly large number of livestock. So when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that it was indeed a place suitable for livestock, the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, Adaroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elia, Sebum, Nebo, and beyond, the land which the Lord conquered before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. They said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. Basically, they finish conquering the Midianites in the east side of the Jordan River, and they divide up the spoil, and now they've got 
thousands of sheep and all kinds of livestock. And the, the tribes of Reuben and Gad pretty much say, you know, the, the land where we're camping right now is looking pretty good uh, to us. And we've killed pretty much everybody on it. And it's empty. So how about if our people just kind of stay right where we are? How about if you guys go on ahead? But we'd like to stick around and settle down right here. And um, as a good leader, I think Moses, though, anticipates a problem with that suggestion. So I think good leaders are kind of looking ahead you know, here's this decision I'm about to make, but what are the consequences going forward? What are the possibilities here? So let's continue then with Numbers 32, 6 through 15. Let's see what happens next. Numbers 32, 6 through 15. But Moses said to the sons of Gad and to the sons of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to war while you yourselves sit here? Now why are you discouraging the sons of Israel from crossing over into the land which the Lord has given them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the sons of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So the Lord's anger burned in that day, and he swore, saying, None of the men who came up from Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. For they did not follow me fully, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and uh, the Kenizzite and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have followed the Lord fully. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until the entire generation of those who had done evil in the sight of the Lord was destroyed. Now behold, you have risen up in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to add still more to the burning anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once more abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all these people. Well, I don't think they were quite anticipating that response. And so, I mean, Moses then is concerned. God told us to go in, cross the river, conquer the promised land. And if these guys stay put, everybody's going to want to stay put. So I'm thinking like as a camp director or something, if, if one kid sits out because he just doesn't want to play volleyball, then you got everybody sitting on the sidelines. And so if this uh, let's just stay right here attitude takes hold, this could be just as bad, if not worse, than what happened 40 years ago in the incident with the 12 spies. Uh, because this looks a whole lot like a lack of faith. We've got this land right here. Let's not risk it going forward. We're just going to stay put. So God gave us that land over there. Uh, if we stay here, we aren't really stepping out in faith like we should. We aren't really obeying the Lord fully. So if we go down this road, we may end up wandering in the wilderness for another 40 years. And Moses is not up to that. And so he's pretty upset here. So this is Moses' concern. It's not fair to the other tribes. And we aren't following the Lord fully. It may seem like a lack of faith to the Lord. All right, let's continue with Numbers 32, verses 16 through 27. Numbers 32, 16 through 27. Then they came near to him and said, We will build here sheepfolds for our livestock and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will be armed ready to go before the sons of Israel until we have brought them to their place, while our little ones live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the sons of Israel has possessed his inheritance. For we will not have an inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has fallen to us on this side of the Jordan toward the east. So Moses said to them, If you will do this, if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for the war, and all of you armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven his enemies out from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you shall return and be free of obligation toward the Lord and toward Israel." And this land shall be yours for a possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Build yourselves cities for your little ones and sheepfolds for your sheep and do what you have promised. The sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben spoke to Moses saying, Your servants will do just as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our livestock... And all our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead, while your servants, everyone who is armed for war, will cross over in the presence of the Lord to battle, just as my Lord says. Well, the men from Reuben and Gad, therefore, they come back to Moses with a suggestion, a possible solution to this. They'll settle on the east side of the Jordan, but they'll do it by getting their livestock and their family settled, while they themselves, the warriors, the men, will cross over the Jordan and help conquer the land. 
and only then when that's done will they return back home to their family so it's not like they're trying to get out of fighting that was moses concern they offer to help and that sounds fair to moses but he clarifies if you refuse to fight you've sinned against the lord and you should be sure that your sin will find you out in other words don't think you can get away with this because god sees what you're doing and what you're not doing uh, verse 24, by the way, has been taken out of context so many times. Um, I've seen sermon outlines. Maybe you've heard sermons from this one verse based on this verse about how, how God will find out if you sin in private. Your sin will find you out. So God is watching our drinking and gambling and smoking and he's going to get us. Um, nothing is hidden from God and, you know, all kinds of things. Your sin is going to find you out. That is not the main point of this passage, okay? So let's be careful that we don't build a, a whole lot of stuff on this one little phrase taken out of context. So we need to be very careful how we use this. And remember, um, it was written into this context. And yes, God does see us at all times and in all places. That is not the point of this particular passage. So let's be careful with that. Uh, toward the end, we find this is agreeable to the tribes of Gad and Reuben. And so this is, in fact, what they plan on doing. So let's continue then with uh, Numbers 32, verses 28 through 42. Numbers 32, 28 through 42. So Moses gave command concerning them to Eleazar the priest, and to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the heads of the father's households of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Moses said to them, If the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben... Um, everyone who is armed for battle will cross with you over the Jordan in the presence of the Lord, and the land is subdued before you. Then you shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. But if they will not cross over with you armed, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. The sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord has said to your servants, so we will do. We ourselves will cross over armed in the presence of the Lord into the land of Canaan. And the possession of our inheritance shall remain with us across the Jordan. So Moses gave to them, to the sons of Gad, and to the sons of Reuben, and to the half-tribe of Joseph's son Manasseh, the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, the king of Bashan, the land with its cities, with their territories, the cities of the surrounding land. The sons of Gad built Dibon, and Adaroth, and Aror, and Athroth, Shophan, and Jazer, and Jogbeha, and Beth Nimrah, and Beth Haran as fortified cities and sheepfolds for sheep. The sons of Reuben built Heshbon, and Elia, and Kiriatham, and Nebo, and Belmion, their names being changed, and Sibma, and they gave other names to the cities which they built. The sons of Macher, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it, and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. So Moses gave Gilead to Macher, the son of Manasseh, and he lived in it. Jer, the son of Manasseh, went and took its towns and called them Havoth Jer. Noba went and took Kenath and its villages and called it Noba uh, after his own name. So if I could just summarize briefly, Moses communicates the plan to Eleazar and to Joshua and to the heads of all the tribes. So this is out there publicly now. So he's getting people to buy into this decision. This is the plan. Everybody agrees. It sounds legit. And then in verse 33, we find the half-tribe of Manasseh uh, gets in on this deal as well. Uh, with their territory, it's going to be split by the Jordan River. So they're going to have some on one side, some on the other. And then we have this list of cities either built or renamed by these uh, men. All right, let's continue by starting into Numbers 33. And we pretty much have a huge list of the names of places where they traveled in their 40-year journey from Egypt to where they are at the moment. And we're just going to start uh, kind of getting a taste of this. Let's look at Numbers 33, 1 through 4. These are the journeys of the sons of Israel, by which they came out from the land of Egypt by their armies, under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Moses recorded their starting places according to their journeys by the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their starting places. They journeyed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the next day after the Passover, the sons of Israel started out boldly in the sight of all the Egyptians, while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn whom the Lord had struck down among them. The Lord also executed judgments on their gods. And again, we're heading into a long list of names in this chapter. Some of these are difficult names. And we start here in Egypt. So immediately after the first Passover, they head out. And they go from there. And from this point, we have this uh, just 
more and more names through this chapter. Many of these places no longer exist. Uh, that's not a problem for us. We know they were traveling in the wilderness. A lot of these places were tiny and insignificant, wouldn't have been mentioned in the literature of the day. And so we don't have really any archaeology on most of these. Um, I would also note that it seems like the list is stylized a bit, and by that I mean some places are left out, so this is not a comprehensive list. And many of these are only mentioned here, so we don't have these mentioned throughout the book of Numbers. Um, and plus, I believe, I, I need to look at this again, but I, I thought that these might have been arranged in like three groups of 40 or something like that. And so it's almost as if Moses is giving the highlights of their journey, maybe in a way that could be memorized. And I would kind of compare it to what we see in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. It's not every single ancestor of the Lord, but he hits the highlights and makes it maybe easier to memorize by kind of keeping them in groups. So that seems to be what's going on here. So let's just kind of skip over the huge list of place names in this chapter. And let's uh, conclude tonight with the last paragraph in this chapter, uh, Numbers 33, verses 50 through 56. All right, Numbers 33, 50 through 56, the uh, end of this chapter anyway. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their molten images and demolish all their high places. And you shall take possession of the land and live in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. To the larger you shall give more inheritance and to the smaller you shall give less inheritance. Wherever the lot falls to anyone, that shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. And as I plan to do to them, so I will do to you. Well, here at the end of this chapter, God reminds Moses of the mission and has him communicate it uh, once again to the people. When you cross over the Jordan, you will drive everybody out. And when you get in there, you're going to have to basically depaganize the land. You will destroy the carved stones, the images. You're going to have to tear down their high places of worship that are being used to worship these idols. So the land is a gift from God, and you are to rid the land of any reference to Baal and all that weird stuff they were doing. And the land then is to be divided among the people as an inheritance. But God warns, though, if you don't do that, if you fail to drive everybody out, if you think you're going to compromise and maybe get along with these people, um, the residents will end up just being a terrible curse. And they're just going to trouble them continually. It'll be like a thorn in your side, a, a prick in your eye. I don't know if you guys have had an eye injury. I've told you about mine before. I was using a circular saw to install a New Baptistry down at the church in Janesville. We were cutting through this kind of particle board. It's not real wood. It's like wood chips and splinters kind of glued together. And one of those flew up and hit me in the eye. I had to go to the ER. Oh, the best feeling in the world, having that numbing, whatever it was, put in your eye with the uh, kind of cotton swab there. But then the doctor could go in there and dig it out without it bothering me. What a relief it was to get that out of there. So God is saying, if you don't get these people out of your land, they're going to just be like, pricks in your eye and a thorns in your side from here on out. So you really need to obey and uh, get those people out of there as God has instructed. So that brings us to the end of Numbers chapter 33. So we're getting closer to crossing over the Jordan River. We'll get to that next week, but uh, we've had a pretty uh, brief overview of God's revenge on the Midianites. We've seen a kind of a compromise proposed by the tribes of Gad and Reuben to settle on the east side. We've seen a, a pretty good solution to that issue. Uh, we've seen a broad overview of the Israelites' travel through the wilderness, and we've had this one final warning. Once you get in there, you need to get rid of everybody. Otherwise, there will be trouble. And uh, again, next week, we hope to wrap up the book of Numbers by looking at chapters 34, 35, and 36. So I want to encourage you and invite you to read ahead if you can. As always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. 
If there's anything we need to be praying about, as we always say, if there's some way we can help or encourage, let us know. We want to hear from you. Uh, you can send an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we know that you are a God who sees what is done to your people. And we know that you are a God who is jealous for us. You want us to worship you and you alone, no other. Like the Israelites, though, we're surrounded by distractions, and so we want to ask for your help as we look to you and you alone for our eternal treasure. We pray for those tonight who are still recovering from falls and injuries, those who are having issues with their bodies, even their minds, and we pray for comfort and healing, and we pray that you would use us to reach out and encourage others as we should. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church, your rule on this earth. Thank you for making us a part of it. We come to you asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen.